Today's video is one that I've been looking to redo for what feels like a very long time, pretty much since the beginning of this channel. Because back then, in the beginning, I covered the story of a young Brooklyn girl named Danielle de Medici. Within two weeks of that video being up, loved ones reached out to let me know that what was in that video wasn't exactly accurate. And that's because what was in the papers back then was extremely one-sided, and it seems like a lot of what was written wasn't really verified. I want to take this moment to thank her family for giving me the blessing to eventually put this video out, for providing pictures and for giving details of who Danielle truly was and what she meant to her family. If you're visiting the channel, please feel free to show your support for this family and the rest that I cover. I say this because I know that that support goes a long way and kind words do mean a lot because when it comes to situations like these, this is a pain that never truly goes away and I truly understand how heavy it can be to see this type of video being put out about family. But the image that was portrayed of Danielle was as if they wanted to make us believe that she was someone who lacked focus and only cared to live in the moment. But that was far from true. Acting out as a teen or having a rough childhood doesn't mean that someone should be written off. Cutting class, experimenting with alcohol, being out with friends late and not coming home when you're supposed to. These are all things that many of us have experienced and a lot of us are doing just fine. As adults, we're not thinking that whatever we did as teenagers is something everyone's gonna judge us on. If that was the case, a lot of us would have a real rough time. Everyone has their challenges in life and everybody walks a different path. But Danielle's path had more obstacles in it than the average teen because she would meet a man that would prey on her and take everything. And it almost felt like she took more blame for her passing after her life was taken than the person who took her life. It's never my intention to reopen old wounds when revisiting cases like this, but I feel it's extremely important to make sure that everybody knows who these victims truly were. Their lives shouldn't come down to just a few articles. And if we don't learn from the past, chances are that we'll just continue to repeat it. So with that being said, Today's video contains very disturbing details, some of the hardest that I've had to bring to you, and they'll be very hard to make it through. Please go in with caution. Viewer discretion is advised. At 07.50 this morning, at 10 minutes to 8, there was a call to 9-11, a female caller who stated that there was a person at 4305 10th Avenue on the second floor with a gun. <laughs> she gave the person's name as James Parker. At 08.30, police here at the scene hear shots being fired inside the apartment. One of the hostages confirms that two people have been shot. It's right after that third volley of shots from inside the apartment that we believe the young lady who was the girlfriend of this person is screaming out that you must get in here because he's gonna kill everybody. We believe at that point he shot his girlfriend and he shot himself. The footage you just watched was captured in September of 1996. It was taken just a few moments after a bloody standoff in the Borough Park section of Brooklyn, New York. Hundreds would gather around and look on as they tried to find out what took place, and it wouldn't be long before the horrible details made their way around. Brooklyn in the 90s had a lot going on. From the Palm Day Massacre in 1984, New York City police are investigating the mass murder of 10 people found shot to death late today in a Brooklyn home. To the slaying of Yusef Hawkins in 1989. <laughs> The borough without a doubt has seen its fair share of controversial moments, and what took place in Borough Park in 1996 was just as significant, because this story involves a young teenage girl, a girl doing everything she could to escape the clutches of a madman, a man who was determined to keep her in his life by any means, and if he couldn't have that, then nobody could, and he would make sure of it, even if it meant taking his own life and hers. On today's episode of Evil Intentions, this is Trapped, the story of Danielle de' Medici.
Danielle de' Medici was born on September 30th, 1978, and resided in Brooklyn, New York. She was born to her father, Richard de' Medici. Growing up in Brooklyn in the mid-90s, Danielle was exposed to both the light and dark sides of the city. She attended PS 131 in Borough Park, where she made plenty of friends. Ever since a young age, Danielle was known to be someone who had a vibrant and very lively personality. She would be seen as a funny child, with behavior such as mooning the school principal because she thought it was funny, or randomly doing cartwheels in the hallway at school. Outside of school, things weren't always the easiest for Danielle growing up. Being so young, it can sometimes be common for someone to become influenced by what they're surrounded by. Brooklyn was a different animal back then, and there was a lot to be influenced by. Danielle was described as someone who had a close relationship with her siblings and the rest of her family. She would always spend time with her sisters, braiding their hair, talking about music, and they would often roam the neighborhood that they grew up in together. She was always there for them when they needed her. She was well known in her neighborhood, and she knew many people who had grown used to seeing her around. When Danielle was described in papers in the 90s, it would seem like a specific picture of her was painted, as if she was some sort of problem child who lacked focus. But this couldn't be further from the truth. Like a lot of us, Danielle had her ups and her downs, her hard times and her good ones. She was just a child finding her way, as a lot of us are at that age. She was loving, caring, and she had many plans for her future, despite the rough patches. Although it was sometimes a rough path to walk at a young age, Danielle was growing up in a neighborhood with a lot of culture, surrounded by many different people, and she had no shortage of friends or family. She built good friendships with a number of people while she was still here. One of those people would change Danielle's young life from the very moment he stepped in, and not in a good way. By the time Danielle reached her teenage years, she was intelligent and had a sense of humor unlike anyone else in her circle, and she was still spontaneous. Sometimes, when she was in high school, she would cut class and go hang out with friends at the corner of 60th Street and 4th Avenue. This is when Danielle would meet a man by the name of James Parker, someone who was a mutual friend to others in her circle. Danielle was only 16 years old and still in high school when she met Parker. He was 24, and he had no business pursuing a teenager. She would often spend time with James, getting to know him, going to nearby rooftops to smoke marijuana and talk eventually leading to the two becoming a couple. Friends say that once the two began dating, it would take almost no time before things drastically changed, and Danielle became somewhat infatuated with Parker, who she would spend most of her time with. He attended Fort Hamilton High School, a school zone for students who resided in the Bay Ridge, Sunset Park, and Diker Heights sections of Brooklyn. He would end up being expelled for a number of different incidents, including cutting class and fighting. He was always fighting, according to a childhood friend. Parker, who Danielle would call by a nickname Gadget, was described by associates as a hulking, temperamental person. He worked at a local pharmacy doing stock work, but was also a part-time crack dealer with an extensive rap sheet that included drug arrests, assaults, and burglary, some of which he had already been convicted for. He was also known for breaking into and stealing cars in broad daylight. Although he was known for his explosive temper, Danielle was enamored. He was gentle with her, and she felt like she had someone who cared about her since she was so young and this was her first relationship like this. But as often is the case with situations like these, the good times didn't last very long for Danielle. A bartender in the neighborhood who'd often see Danielle had this to say. She looked innocent, in good health. Then she got together with him and she got the tattoos and the nose ring. Of course, none of what this man said means that she was on the wrong path. It just seems like the influence Parker had over her was noticeable. But all of this would continue in other, more troubling ways. It began with her returning home after days of no communication with family or friends. She would return home, and when family would ask her where she was and why she hadn't reached out or let anyone know that she was okay, Danielle would sometimes angrily lash out and defend her relationship, since people close to her knew that this sudden and more erratic behavior had only started when she met Parker. Events like this would often unfold, but with time, they would become much more serious. By every single account, James Parker was a thug, and only time would really tell how evil he could really become. He was real jealous. If she was saying something, he would smack her in the head and say, I'm talking, 
said one of Danielle's closest friends at the time, according to reports. Verbal and physical abuse would become a normal part of Danielle and Parker's relationship, and it started only after a few short months. She would go from returning home after days on end, defending her relationship, to soon after returning home, covered in bruises, cuts, and cigarette burns. He would burn her toes so she couldn't run away from him, and most of all, to inflict extreme pain. Danielle, only a teenager, had found herself in the hands of a monster. She would tell her friend that she believed Parker was so evil that he wasn't even a human being. Despite feeling this way, Danielle would become pregnant with Parker's child in the spring of 1996. People around Danielle, herself included, hoped that the arrival of a baby would change Parker's treatment of her. But this would prove to be wishful thinking, since things would only become much, much worse. During a disturbing altercation on June 28th of 1996, Danielle and James were driving along the Belt Parkway when an argument between the two escalated. Danielle had become fed up with Parker and how he treated her, so she attempted to break up with him. She would try to leave his car, but he pulled her back inside by force and began to punch Danielle in the face over and over again with a closed fist. He would continue to drive around with Danielle in his car for almost two hours, punching her repeatedly and striking her in the head with a baseball bat several times. She waited a few days before reporting the incident to authorities out of fear for her life because Parker's attitude and his temper was completely unpredictable. In fact, exactly one month prior to this, Parker got into a physical confrontation with a sergeant and he fought another cop when he was caught with possession of marijuana in Coney Island. He was arraigned on May 28th and was let out the same day. Danielle showed up to the courtroom with $650 for his bail. On July 7th of that year, he was arrested and charged with second-degree assault, unlawful imprisonment, and menacing, with his bail being set to $7,500. The judge didn't believe that a stock boy who worked at a pharmacy earning $200 a week would be able to afford it, but Parker's brother would post a $7,500 bail the very next day. Prosecutors asked for a bail of $25,000, seeing as how Parker was known to be extremely violent and he was a ticking time bomb. Parker had been arrested nine times on all sorts of charges, but prosecutors never told the judge that Parker had already spent nearly two years in prison for beating his ex-girlfriend and his ex-girlfriend's father in 1989. He hit the girl's father with a hammer, bit him, and slashed the victim with a knife, and he was still on probation in 1993 for a drug conviction. Danielle would realize that things were nowhere near calm when Parker, who was due back in court on July 12th of 1996, had jumped the bail and was out on the streets. Due to Parker being somewhere out there and Danielle's abuse becoming more and more violent, the judge ordered that NYPD maintain 24-hour surveillance on Danielle's home. She was also granted an order of protection and given a pendant that she could wear around her neck. She would be able to press a button on this alarm pendant that would send a signal to authorities to let them know that she was in danger. This was an initiative brought forth by the District Attorney's Domestic Violence Bureau. These pendants were only worn by a few dozen women in the city who were considered to be in the gravest danger. But still, to the horror of Danielle, who was now six months pregnant, this would do absolutely nothing to slow Parker down. Danielle was now pregnant and very deep into a relationship with a man who manipulated her and brought nothing but violence. A man who preyed on her because she was so young and he knew he could inflict that fear into her. Her friends and family all tried to keep her out of harm's way, but Parker was determined, and it would only become much harder to keep Danielle safe. On August 29th of 1996, Parker, now a fugitive, returned to the six-bedroom apartment Danielle shared with her loved ones and extended family. He snuck his way in and wielded an Uzi and a hammer, and he ordered that Danielle be woken up. He would say, if you call the cops, I'm gonna blow her head off, said a witness in the home. He was there to kidnap Danielle, and he was willing to shed anybody's blood if she refused. The witness in the home also confirmed that Danielle wasn't wearing the pendant she was given by the courts. This is because when Parker came looking for Danielle, he ripped it off her neck and threw it out of the window. When that happened, she told the courts about the incident, and they failed to provide her with a new one. James made Danielle leave the house and get into a cab with him, but she mentioned that he was weirdly gentle with her after kidnapping her. 
Eventually, she was able to escape Parker and return to her home unharmed on September 5th. Friends who were close to Danielle visited her at her apartment, and she would tell them that Parker held her captive in a crack house for five days. She would go on to show her friends tattoos she had gotten of Parker's nickname, Gadget, the big bold letters going across her stomach and another just like it going across her back. What the hell are you going to do if you ever break up with this guy? Asked her friend. Danielle would let out a confident and playful laugh, and she replied, Gadget will never leave me. He loves me, and he will be with me till the end. A few short moments later, she was telling her friends about how he burned her back with cigarettes and burned her feet with matches, even though they thought that she returned unharmed. The truth is, they just couldn't see what she was talking about. The wounds were covered. Everyone around Danielle had been aware for quite some time that things were getting as bad as they could possibly get, but Danielle would find it impossible to be free of Parker's hold on her. At one point, things got so bad that Danielle's family sent her away to Florida to keep her away from Parker, but he would somehow find out where she was and went out there to go get her and brought her back to New York City by force. He attacked her father when he went to go get her, showing that no matter what, no matter how many miles were between them, he would always keep coming after her. Danielle had reached the end of her rope. She tried her best to escape the deranged Parker time and time again. Friends and family closest to her tried their best to keep her safe. But on the morning of September 16th of 1996, a home invasion would result in everything coming to a horrifying end. Parker, who was still on the run, waited patiently for officers to loosen their grip and lighten security around Danielle's 10th Avenue home. He would get his wish. Just a week before this, the 24-hour surveillance at the home was cut to irregular checks with a squad car that would drive by. So, Parker found his opportunity. At 7.49 a.m., Parker made his way to the building and approached someone who lived there, a downstairs neighbor. He would pull out a 30 caliber pistol and put it to the side of her head. She was on her way to take her six-year-old son, Christopher, to school. She would signal her son to get away from the area as Parker forced her up the stairs toward Danielle's home. I knew who it was right away, she said. If you do what I say, you won't get hurt. But if you don't, you'll get hurt. I don't know who answered. It was open to crack and he pushed in, said the neighbor. Parker barricaded himself in the apartment with 10 other people who were there that day, three of them being children. From the apartment, he had a perfect view and command of the staircase via a peephole. Shortly after, a call would come from that apartment to NYPD. The police would begin to surround Danielle's home within minutes. In a horrifying and twisted turn of events, Danielle's home had now become the center of a hostage siege. Hostage negotiators who spoke to Parker on the phone said he threatened to shoot all the hostages unless police left the area. At 8.30 a.m., a man living in the building next door that had a wall the two buildings shared stated that he heard frantic screams and from time to time, the sounds of a gun being shot. That first shot he heard was tearing through the chest of Danielle's uncle, one of the people who was there that day, only 25 years old at the time. At 9.20 a.m., Danielle's uncle's blood-soaked shirt was tossed from the window of Danielle's apartment, letting officers know for the first time that Parker was starting to make do on his threats. At 9.35 a.m., another shot would ring out, and this time, a bullet would rip through the leg of that man's girlfriend. The woman who was shot recalled Parker stomping on Danielle's uncle as he lay wounded, screaming, Who do I shoot next? At this point, Danielle's uncle recalls being woken up and the first thing he saw was Parker standing there with a 38 caliber pistol. The first words he said were, Don't move or I'll blow your head off. Parker ordered everybody in the home to sit down and began telling all his hostages that a few days prior, he had told his three-year-old son that he wouldn't see his daddy anymore. Parker would proceed to grab one of the victims in the home in a chokehold by their neck, dragging her around the apartment and placing her at his feet, making her kneel in front of him whenever he sat by the front door. He did this several times in the home to others, including Danielle. He started hitting her in the face with the phone. He was calling her a slut and telling her that she was disrespecting their baby, said one of the witnesses in the home. Danielle tried to calm Parker down by assuring him that everything was going to be okay, telling him, it's going to be okay, honey. He would reply, oh, now I'm honey. And then 
he began to strike her with the phone again. Others watched on in horror as Parker continued to inflict his pain on the household, not knowing if they'd make it out alive. Everybody was pretty hysterical. He was trying to make some point nobody was getting. And that's when he said, that's it. I'm going to start shooting people. I enjoy this. I was born to do this. This is everything I've lived for. The cops think they can take me. They think I'm stupid, but little do they know. In the middle of this chaos, Parker reloaded his 38 caliber pistol and laughed. He began to talk about one of Danielle's relatives and how they had once called him the devil. I'm the devil, am I? Parker would then grab Danielle's sister by the neck and dragged her into the bedroom where her grandmother was sitting down. Parker reached into his back pocket to take out a picture of his son. He held the picture up to her and said, I don't get to see my son again, so you're not going to get to see your son again. He then held the gun up to her head and fired, shooting her once in the head at point blank range. Parker went into a frenzy after this as Danielle would call for the cops to come in, screaming at the top of her lungs that the cops had to get in there because he was going to kill everybody. SWAT teams threw percussion grenades to the window and skylight of the apartment to cause a distraction. The officers would yell at everyone in the house to get down and take cover as they stormed the apartment, the apartment that Parker remained barricaded in for nearly two hours. As police ran up the stairs, as an entire neighborhood watched on, and as the hostages remained crippled with fear, Parker, his window of opportunity quickly closing, brought the barrel of his 38 caliber pistol to the left side of Danielle de Medici's head and fired two fatal shots, killing her and their unborn child. He would then start to point at the children in the home, stating that he was going to kill them next. Danielle's family, having witnessed her just get murdered in front of them, jumped on Parker's back and tried to fight the gun away from him. And all of this was happening as officers broke through the door. And when that happened, Parker would pull the gun on himself, letting off one fatal shot. He was dead instantly. People have been generally afraid to walk the streets. Uh, there have been, there was an assault not too long ago, in fact, to, uh, where uh, the owner of one of the stores here was assaulted very, very badly. His face was cut. Uh, that created even greater fear in the community. Thank you. 
morning. I'm the first deputy police commissioner to San Jose Simonetti. And that, let me tell you the uh, chain of events here. At 07.50 this morning, at 10 minutes to 8, there was a call to 9-11, a female caller, who stated that there was a person at 4305 10th Avenue on the second floor with a gun. <laughs> she gave the person's name as James Parker. She also indicated to us that James Parker was wanted for kidnapping. At 0830, police here at the scene hear shots being fired inside the apartment. At 0920, a female who we believe to be a hostage throws a bloody t-shirt out the front window. At 0930, we hear a second, second rounds of shots being fired. By the way, as this has taken place, the, the TARU unit, the Te Technical Assistance Resource Unit, has already had telephonic communication with people in the apartment. After those second rounds of shot, one of the hostages confirms that two people have been shot. At uh, 10.05, we hear some more shots being fired. It's right after that third volley of shots from inside the apartment that we believe the young lady who was the girlfriend of this person is screaming out that you must get in here because he's gonna kill everybody. And it's at that point that the on-site commander made a decision to make an entry into the apartment. By the way, we use some diversionary devices just before entering. So our officers can enter, we can, we can kind of get the people away from the door. As we are making entry, we hear more gunshots. We believe, and we haven't had an opportunity yet to talk to the, survive, the, the surviving hostages, but we believe at that point he shot his girlfriend and he shot himself. By the way, Mr. Parker is dead. He has been pronounced dead. Uh, in addition, so what we have is we have five people who were shot. We have Mr. Parker with a self-inflicted gunshot wound. We have the young lady who is his girlfriend, appears to be pregnant. She's shot in the head in very, very critical condition. We have another female shot to the head in very critical condition. We have a female who's shot in the leg who's being treated at the hospital, and we have a male shot in the chest. In the addition to those five people, there are six additional people in the apartment. There are two female adults, there are three young children, and we believe them all to be less than five years of age, and we have one female teenager who was removed to the hospital for trauma. That's where we are. The investigation is continued. The chief of detective in a matter of hours, every last part of this relationship boiled down to these last horrifying moments. A community would find themselves torn and broken over tragic events that some might say couldn't be prevented. Loved ones mourned over the losses suffered and questioned how something so horrific could happen. And of all places, here. What happened to Danielle would cause the New York City Police Department to come under fire as people believe that their lack of patience and removal of 24-hour surveillance on her home while Parker was on the loose was what led to her death. Police officials would fire back stating that they found Danielle to be uncooperative. It felt like everybody was just trying to blame a child for her own death. Someone who tried time and time again to be free of his clutches. And when she was left to fend for herself, nobody wanted to take responsibility. Later, it would be learned that authorities had been warned by Danielle's grandmother that Parker made a threat to them. She would say, he swore he'd come back and kill Danielle and the whole family, but they still decided to take their 24-hour surveillance off. Judge Bruno, who granted Parker bail at $7,500, would also come under fire for how low the amount was, allowing Parker to go free. But he said that he felt this was justified because of the information he was presented with. But still, he admitted to feeling terrible about the tragic outcome. I feel terrible about this lady. I did what I felt was right based on what I had before me. What happened to Danielle is a perfect example of how a terrible situation can escalate once they've reached a very violent point. A young woman with hopes, dreams, friends, family, everything taken from her in seconds, leaving her loved ones and those closest to her with broken hearts. 
wounds that wouldn't heal anytime soon. One man's rage and self-destructive behavior became one family's hell as they lived day to day not knowing if Parker would ever go off the deep end and follow through with his threats until the day that he did. Danielle was only a kid and she relied on help, but instead she was treated as if she'd done this all to herself with the people who were doing all the judging not knowing the severity of Parker's violent ways and not understanding the mind of a teen who spends her days living in fear. She was only doing whatever he asked to save her own life and that of her family. As young adults, many of us have gone through what Danielle went through. The influences on the street, the cutting class, the peers around us who may introduce us to new things that our parents just don't agree with. But we all had the chance to learn from those moments to decide what type of person we'd like to be. Danielle will never get that chance. Her fate was sealed when Parker decided he would never give her up. Not for anyone and not for anything, even if it meant taking her life and dying in the process. Just four days before taking Danielle's life, James Parker called Danielle's home frantic, asking her to marry him. She would reply, are you nuts? How long do you think we'd be happy? It would be two weeks before you'd bash my skull in. Her friends would still recall the haunting words she spoke when describing Parker's love for her. She said he would never leave her and he would be with her until the end. Unfortunately, she was right. Danielle planned on naming her baby girl Athena. Rest in peace, Danielle de' Medici, and my deepest condolences go out to her family and loved ones. You aren't forgotten.